Welcome to the next podcast of Melon Info. I'm your host, Lauren Ritchie. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this episode of Melon Info. In this series, we welcome Melanos from across the globe into your ears and studio. For this episode, I'm excited to welcome Denise and Spencer. Denise is the founder of the British School of Millinery, writer and publisher of the book Tiara Headdresses, and a contributor to The Hat Magazine, where we get to work together a little bit. I hope you enjoy this episode with Denise, but first, I'd like to thank our wonderful podcast sponsors for their support of this series. Hatlocks Australia, Louise McDonald Milliner, House of Adorn, The Hat Magazine, Hatter's Millinery Supplies, Lifted Millinery, Be Unique Millinery, Judith M. Millinery Supply House, Hats by Lego, Hat Academy, and Millinery Australia. As always, you can find a link to one of these fantastic businesses in our show notes. That's either in the podcast app that you're listening to this episode on, or through our website. Head over to see what they might have on offer for you. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast series. I certainly enjoy bringing you these conversations with our industry leaders. I hope you might find them inspiring. Pick up a few ideas for your own millinery business, either through design or a business concept. If this might be the case, I'd like to invite you to become a patron of Millinery Info. It's like a little thank you to us for bringing you this episode or inspiring you for your own. There's a tier called A Little Thank You to Millinery Info, which is just $5 a month. It's a little over a copy when you listen to the episode, but it helps us to continue to bring you this podcast and the great content that you see on Millinery Info. Head over to www.patreon.com forward slash Millinery Info to sign up or to find out more. If you have an idea for a podcast with someone in our industry, I'd love to hear from you. Send me over an email to lauren at millinery.info or inbox me on Instagram. I'd love to hear your ideas and who you'd like to hear from as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Denise. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, Denise. It's wonderful to finally have you on here. Oh, thank you. Let's go. Let's go back to the beginning. Millinery. How did it first start for you? Well, it's a bit of a long, long story. Um, I... uh, I was working as a dancer for a holiday company called Pontins over here, very big holiday company. And I've been making the costumes and everything. And I suddenly said, right, bong, that's it. I'm going to college. So I'd already done two years with South End College of Design before I went off and became a Pontins helper, shall I say, blue coat. But anyway, never mind. Um, So... (laughs) I uh, trained as a pattern cutter with Hazel Pethick, who made all the costumes for the Monty Python um, TV shows. And she would tell us stories and I loved her stories. And I would actually meet her again and again and again throughout my career. It was really weird. Um, And then I went to Northbrook, which is part of Brighton University, and I met the most amazing um, designers there. One who was Natasha Kornikoff, who made all of David Bowie's costumes. John King, who was the head cutter for Glyndebourne. Um, he was amazing and lots of millinery people that came in and out of the course. It was one of those courses, Lauren, that um, it was mainly two thirds of the course were live projects. And basically those live projects were amazing live projects. So we got to work on a big uh, production for Worthing Theatre of the King and I. And then we do something for the London Underground Museum, of which I think the costumes are still there and on models at the museum. And um, and for Chichester Festival Theatre and Glyndebourne. I mean, we had so many opportunities and we were really blessed. So, um, yeah, it was one of those kind of things. And... To, to have two thirds of your course being on live projects, you certainly learned a lot. And, and I did. And I was kind of pushing my um, career into like costumes, but then everybody else was pushing me the other way and saying, no, 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 you should be doing costume props and blah, 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 blah. And so, um, yeah, after that, I uh, moved to London and went and worked at Burmans and Nathans, which is now uh, Angels. And yes. 
bumped into Hazel again, which was amazing because we knew each other and I got to work on um, one of her productions, which was really lovely and great for her because she said, well, she was my student. And um, and I was there at the same time as Louise McDonald and Philip Rhodes. And we got to work on um, somebody who I've just seen, uh, Susanna Buxton, who did uh, Mr. Rose Virgins for BBC. And the director was at this thing I've just been to in um, Huddersfield, um, who happened to be Danny Boyle of, <laughs> you know, train spotting. And it was amazing. We were all there and it, oh, it was just fantastic. I had a lovely time there. Anyway, that was a few weeks ago. So um, I still have these haunting sounds of can Mr. Philip Rhodes come to reception, please? And can Louise McDonald come to reception? It was really weird because we all kept getting running. Um, the ladies department was on the top floor. So the ladies always either had to run down the stairs. We weren't allowed to use the lifts if there were really top stars in the building. We had to use the stairs, but most of the time we all sneaked in the lifts and then it would open up on the first floor where they were doing all the uh, fittings and everything and some actor would walk in. And um, uh, yeah, I I think I mentioned this on Facebook once, that, um, you know, the doors opened and in walked James Bond and it was like, oh my God, it was... Uh, uh, Sean Connery and we were all standing there and trying not to say anything and we weren't allowed to be in the lift anyway but we just took it because we were lazy and um, yeah and he he turned around to all of us and in his Scottish voice he said well this is nice ladies isn't it and it was you know it was just those kind of things that I remember I had a great time at Berman's it was real real good fun and I'm sure Louise and Philip had exactly the same impression there it was really good and fantastic grounding I, you know you really got a lot of uh, grounding there yeah and then I but moved in, in, into theatre and went to Theatre Royal Windsor and discovered the secret passages under the theatre and the castle which were fantastic because the corgis used to run up the secret passages and they'd turn up in wardrobe and then the security guards would run after them and say sorry about this and then tempt them back with a little bit of fish you know or something which was you know and it had to be good quality it couldn't be you know a biscuit or something because they'd turn their nose up at it but anyway yeah so that was my life and working at Theatre Royal Windsor was brilliant. Yeah, it was fantastic. Good grounding. And then I became freelance. So you were so, free, um, when you were in those positions, were you in women's wardrobes, so mainly still pattern cutting through that time? Uh, well, I was pattern cutting. I was kind of verging on to the costume prop, so I used to get sent out to buy stuff. But, yeah, we did deal with men's costume sometimes and I remember an incident in uh, Theatre Royal Windsor where we said to a guy a really famous actor and I cannot mention his name because he would cringe at this we said to him can you um we were about to do a fit in with him can you take your clothes off and we walked out the room obviously because that's the courteous thing to do and then two of us always had to go in so we walked in and he's starkers absolutely stark naked and we go no 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 you leave your pants on <laughs> you know and I had to run out and um yeah it was one of those kind of situations where we needed a towel and quickly you know uh, sort of like uh, uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, a bit embarrassing that. But uh, anyway, very famous actor, still around at the moment. And I could really make a lot of money by saying who it was, but I'm not going to. Anyway, there you go. I'll leave that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you said you went on to a freelance. What was, what was the trigger for that? I'm not quite sure, really. I think... Uh, travel and um, in those days you had to travel a long way to get to your job um I remember working at Burma's I used to have to get up at six o'clock in the morning as as a teenager as you know you don't like getting up at that time in the morning as I'm discovering my with my daughters at the moment um so basically yeah it was that and I just wanted to have more free time um 
you know, at the time, my husband at the time worked at night. So I used to come in and then he used to go out um, because he was a, a, muso, a musician for a big um, company. So he would then go out and I wouldn't see him and I'd go out in the morning and he'd be in bed and I'd run off. Um, so it was that kind of thing. So I wanted to be more at home and I got a lot of freelance work Um again and again from Berman's after I'd left. Um, I used to do a lot for their um, prep company that they had, which was separate from Berman's. And we used to do a lot of work for that. So I got to work on, oh, so many things. And, um, you know, it it was just that it, it became easier to be freelance, I think. So I quickly moved into that area. And I also got a um kind of um technician's job at a university as well uh which happened to be the university that I would then go on and take a degree at but I didn't know that at the time and um yeah so um and that's when I made the link with Suzanne Neville, Ben Delisi and Jane Bolton those three came together and I also did um another 10 years with another um, theatre um, in the Palace Theatre Watford, which was great. So I got I got so much varied work. It was unbelievable. And um, yeah, I think that's what you have to do. You just pick up what you can as a freelancer. And there are jobs that I did that I didn't really like, but I just did them because they bought me money. And then the other jobs I really liked. Um, I think one year I was doing um, mob caps and uh, things, um, the uh, Puritan caps and coifs for um, Les Mis. And um, <laughs> I was also doing then three pantomimes. So I was dealing with uh, you know, pant three pantomime dames and, you know, fairies. I did loads of fairies. Um, so I'm really good at making crowns and uh, things like that. So it was really varied, the work, and I loved it. I really loved it, including making, uh, working for um, Madame Two Swords, making the hat that went on the Queen Mother statue in Madame Two Swords in London. And that was on hold for ages because they were waiting for her to not be around anymore before they change it because she was in court costume and then they changed it into normal costume. That was a bit weird because they sent me a head over, a wax head, and I had to sign a, an agreement and nobody was allowed to look at it or anything. But it was it was like a purpley pinky colour which was really weird and it looked like Winston Churchill which was even weirder but it was her wax dummy head but it was the like one of the rejects so I had the complete size that I could fit the whole thing to that was weird and I had it on my table when I used to come down you know, get up in the morning, come down and see it. It was horrible. It was just, it just looked really, it wasn't horrible, horrible, but it was weird having that in my living room. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, it, the work was so varied, got to work with, uh, do Shakespeare stuff. Um, uh, did one of the biggest Hamlets um, that they ever did. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's a really fam famous actor now. See, when you work on so many productions, you forget the names of the people that you work with. Um, yeah, so there was quite a lot um, of work and uh, a lot of TV work as well. I used to do uh, freelance for Channel 4 quite a lot and do um, I did the whole of a uh, series of. Um, uh, oh, God, Viva Cabaret, which was a big series that launched lots of our comedians here um careers off and uh it was great and uh, you know one minute I'd be stretching a hat the next minute I'd have my hands down Tom Jones's trousers and there are not many women that can say that either but yeah uh, it was things like that uh, where I was altering his trousers I, I wasn't on, he, they weren't on him just let me make that clear but there were things like that that happened yeah
cool. And when you started going freelance, did you set up the space at home or where were you working from? Yeah, I was at home mainly. Um, and I had a studio at the end of the garden in my garden. So I'd have to run from the house to the garden to get to the studio. And I could only work there in the summer because it was too cold in the winter. So I had to then work in the house in the winter um, because there wasn't any heat in. And um, yeah, it was it was really an experience, um, definitely. So yeah, yeah. And then at some point in there, you started focusing on some more millinery. What, how did that come about? Well, um, I went. I had. I visited a shop that's not there anymore in London called uh, Paul Craig's in Darbley Street, and they had this big. It was really lovely. You'd open the door and you'd go down the stairs and round the corner, and there'd be like this little grovel where <laughs> loads of millinery things were, and you'd go round, and somebody would walk round with you and say, "What is it you're trying to do?" And I saw Rose's advert on the door and I took all the number down and everything by hand. You didn't have phones in those days and, um, you know, wrote it all down and then got home and rang her and, you know, went to go to a class. And in fact, the first class, Rose was ill, uh, but she didn't let me or Prudence, um, who I also used to sit next to was there and neither of us knew that the class had been cancelled so we went <laughs> the class was cancelled anyway the following week we went and then I got to meet and sit next to people like Edwina Ibbotson, Bridget Bailey you know everybody had been trained by Rose you know was there basically and I have a lot to thank Rose for because um she helped me to fill the gaps of the skills that I needed, um, you know, and also you learn from each other. And that's when I knew that I wanted to do that. Um, but one day, because of my um, my theatrical background, everything was big and gaudy and horrible, <laughs> sort of like that I was making. And one day, um, you know, I saw some, I think it was Prudence work and I looked at her work and I thought, I want to be like that. I don't want to be like this. And so I, you know, got Rose aside and said, I want to do that. I don't want to do this. And I know I'm untidy and I know I'm not doing what I should be doing. So from that day onwards, <laughs> she made me unpick everything. And I would sit there and sew and she'd go, no, not right do it again <laughs> sort of like so it was like being in a workroom it was great because she you know well not that anybody in a workroom would uh, sit and unpick stuff hopefully they do it right in the first time but she would make me unpick and do it again or if it was untidy redo it and that was I think I talked in my um, notes that I gave you about eureka moments that was the very first one and the very first thing I completed after I got to a point where I was ready, got straight into the front cover of a magazine. So then I knew it was there. It was it was ready to go. It. Yeah. And that's when I knew that, you know, that I wanted to do that. And yeah, and that was my Eureka moment. And yeah, I, I didn't I literally did not look back. I had worked previously, but it wasn't that eureka moment where you know that's where you want to go and where you want to be and how you want to develop from there onwards. And really and truthfully, from that moment, I didn't look back. And for years, I had masses and masses of work and turning work away because I just oh, couldn't beautiful. do it on my own. So I was in a really good position then. Yeah. Great. And I can just jump back to when you were learning from Rose for a moment. Is that, were there certain skills that she was teaching you or you went along through her own project? How did that pass? How did well, that work when you were going along to learn? Yeah, I went, I usually went along with my own project. I would have something at home that I needed to make or I wanted to make or the design I wanted to do. And I would have it in my mind when I went to Rose. I'd take everything with me and say, 
this is what I want. How do I do this? And I would learn the skills. So one week I could be working on felt. The next week I could be working on maybe headbands or something like that. And in those days, it was a different kind of headband that you would be working on in different ways. So that's how my workings would be but then I would also have those little side projects because I think we're all we've all got that where we've got projects on the side that if a job hadn't come up we would be working on and I would also have those which then helped me to develop uh, a collection for them working with somebody like Ben Delisi or Suzanne Neville or Jane Bolton because I would be able to develop those at home yeah amazing and how long did you learn from Rose for I think it was about two or three years it was so long that when I used to go over for the classes she used to teach in some adult education places and she used to say to me oh do you want a job next week um because I've got to go and do something do you want to go and teach my class for me and she gave me those little sections of teaching I don't know whether she thought that I would be good at it or whatever but all I was there to do was to just guide people because it was you know two hour class which you can't really in a two hour class get a lot done I mean we got loads done in the five hour class but you know in a two hour class there's very little by the time the ladies had come in or ladies and gents came in put their stuff down got their cup of tea and started working <laughs> you know you then had I think about an hour if you were lucky after they were talking about what their daughter had done at school and things like that you know you would have time and also because the classes were so big by the time I got round to everybody you know um it was you know they probably learned one or two things if they were lucky you know and that's the way that adult education classes are that's why it's so good to learn from somebody face to face really and you know this because it's just so much more valuable as far as the amount of skills you can get but no I'm grateful for Rose allowing me to you know do that and it was great that she thought of me I mean I was the other side of London I was in West London she was in East London I did have to travel over but I enjoyed doing it and I enjoyed working for Rose as well it was really good yeah. was that your first foray into teaching yes it was <laughs> yeah yeah it was um not teaching as such because um being a dancer previously I'd um taught at dancing schools but that's totally different that's not like this <laughs> teaching at dancing schools all you've got to do is just watch and make sure everybody's in time with the music whereas with this you've got to make sure that they've actually done something before they go on to the next step otherwise things can go wrong and yeah it was uh, a different way of teaching. I mean, everybody learns in different ways. And if you're a teacher, you have to adapt your skills that you have to teach to their level. So you'd be going up and down all over the place um, when you're teaching and it is exhausting. I know that for a fact. So, and then a two hour there and a two hour back journey. That was quite interesting. Yeah. Great, all the way across London. I know, I know. I was very dedicated. I'm not sure I would do that now. I won't even go to the shops if I don't need to. I usually send my children. But anyway, there you go. Right. Or my husband. <laughs> oh, no, don't fancy doing that. You go, you know. So, uh, yeah. No, I'm not sure I do now. Anyway, there you go. I know. So once you were teaching for Rosie, you were still freelancing. What was, what was next for your career? Well, um... <laughs> I had a visit from two students. I was, um, this is a great story, this one. Um, I was teaching for Rose, doing kind of pantomime stuff and things like that. I was really happy. And then two students came along and they said, we want to broaden our skills, which kind of hit a bell with me. And, you know, that was really good because they wanted to broaden their skills 
they they were at Croydon College. They were learning how to make costumes and things like that. And when I eventually got there and saw what they were doing, I was just in awe of what they were actually making. It was amazing. But um, yeah, when these stu two students came and I thought, you know, you're really that's really good that you've realized, you know, that's quite grown up to realize that you need um, more skills to add to your portfolio. So you, you can say, I can do that, you know, and um, uh, then the university, which it is now, but was Croydon College of Art, rang me and said, can you come in and do some extra teaching? So I went in <laughs> And I walked in the doors and in front of me was Natasha Kornikoff, who I trained with at Worthing. And she was, you know, David Bowie's costume maker. And she went, oh, it's you. <laughs> and it was hilarious because I thought, oh, does she know who I am then? And uh, so we were chatting and I was teaching. And I was doing all my stuff. And then lunch break was like to rule you had to go and have your hour lunch so I was sitting in the coffee area and we were sitting there together and she she confessed to me that she didn't think I would ever be a costumier and that was quite shocking you know I was the really did you think that I would do and then she said I'm going to eat humble pie and say I'm sorry because I was wrong and from it was from that day on that I vowed I would never judge a student, no matter how hard it was to teach that student, because and this is where the teaching styles comes in. Uh, I've studied this. I did this in my degree um, where the range of teaching styles there are to teach in, you must be able to give those different ways of teaching you may go up to somebody and say you've got to do it this way and then they'll say um, didn't quite get that so you then have to switch this switch on in your head and say actually have you tried it this way and then try another way of teaching them because we all accept instructions in different ways and um you have to then learn how to teach it to somebody and I <laughs> There was one young lady when I was teaching in Cheltenham that, oh, my goodness, it was so, so hard to teach her. And I used every technique. And I went back into the house after her lesson and said, I've used everything. I don't know what to do. I don't know what adaptation I need to make. And Richard said, hang on a minute. Is it you? I went, What? <laughs> How can it be me? But he was right. It was me and the, the way that I was teaching her, you know, how I was trying to get the information over to her. So I rewound and then started again. And from that day onwards, she flew. So it is it is really interesting teaching. I love it as a subject. It's absolutely brilliant. Every technique that I have learned, whether it be from a teacher, whether it be from the way I've taught a student, that's really invaluable. When you're teaching students, you can learn things about your teaching. There are some teachers out there, I'm, and I'm not going to put any teachers down at all, but there are some teachers out there who just teach one style, one way, again and again and again. And what we're getting now is one style one way again and again and again in what the people are producing you should not be seen the person who's teaching should not be seen in what the student is producing so I can I know this sounds really brash and I'm sorry and if it disgusts anybody I'm really sorry but I can tell from every person's hat that's on the internet that's shown on the internet where they've been taught because of what they produce and it is very true because if you give too much of what you are into it you shouldn't be doing that you should be teaching 
um, skills. That's it. Nothing else. It's what that student does with those skills that gives us Philip Treacy, Stephen Jones, you know, and all the new students, um, not students, but all the new designers that are coming up at the moment. It gives us those people. And if you can see that teacher in there, that's not a good job. That teacher hasn't done a good job because they've imposed their designs on you and that's wrong. That's not what a teacher should do. And that's one of the things that I learned from what <laughs> Natasha told me. I should never, you know, impose any of it because I think that's what Natasha did with us. Is she tried to impose the way that she was learning and she had her favorites and that's not right. That's not right at all. You should say, there you are, there are the skills. Now go and do what you need to do with it because it is just... I think that's the most invigorating thing that you can see is what somebody does with what you've taught them. And I often see some of my students work online and, that, you know, various teachers go, oh, this is one of my students. Well, we know that because we can see the style. I never say this is very rarely. And I, <laughs> you know, the rebel that I am. Lauren, I will only do it to annoy somebody and say, mm, yes, this is one of my students too. But you shouldn't be able to see where that person has been taught. You should be saying, oh, how was that done? Where did they learn that? That's what you should be saying. And there's very few designers at the moment that you can say that from. Sorry, that's my perched bit. I've done it now. <laughs> Got it out of the way. Now, rolling back to all that teaching expertise, when did you fit in a teaching degree? Yeah, well, long story. Um, husband de decided to, you know, sack me, but then I eventually sacked him. So we'll get that out of the way. So, um, and left me with twins at 10 months. And basically, I then thought, right, I've got to do something. I was, I just started my degree course. Um, I think it was the final chance that you could take a degree without paying for it in England. So I stepped in and did it. And, um, and my my friend who also teaches in adult um, ed, she did it as well at the same time. And, um, and I just took it. I went to... Um, Middlesex University great university fantastic and because I had the twins I was allowed and they were very young at the time I was allowed to kind of stagger my degree which was amazing so um and going through a very acrimonious divorce I took that and then ended up with a 2-1 in teaching so that's brilliant you know it was fantastic wow. it was great and my mum had very close to me my mum was there and she stood up in the middle of the university arena and she stood up and she went that's my daughter and, clapped oh. and everybody cheered it was lovely so it was a really lovely oh, time you. but kind of you know emotional so um yeah so I took that while um I had the twins bringing them up on my own I was also teaching part-time in a secondary school which was also liberating and also very very interesting um and um yeah so even though I wasn't around in the millinery industry very much I was still you know, getting my skills, getting my back up. If there's anybody out there listening now and you want to do something, well, basically all I want to say to you is that it's possible. You can do it. You should do it. And please just jump and do it because I haven't looked back since I've taken that degree. And, you know, it's it's been great. Even um, I... I was very lucky I got to teach at, you know, Cheltenham Ladies College, Cheltenham um, College itself, independent schools that were part of what we call um, the rugby group, which was really good. And I learned so much about people. From teaching, you were teaching textiles-based, fashion-based subjects? Yeah, but I got millinery in there. 
<laughs> so <laughs> well, she did. Have... So I was gonna ask how how millinery is going through this time, and you're yeah. doing a lot more millinery now. What brought you back? Yeah, I mean, it was that that brought me back. I think because when I was teaching that side of the subject, and I was getting boys to do millinery and things like that, and it made me think, well, why haven't we got a millinery exam that's that level? You know, because I'm sure it would inspire more people. And I did eventually write several. You know, why were we not given the opportunities from school level? Because it's it's quite we're quite capable of doing that. And maybe we should send people in. I've been um, teaching people with um, disabilities at the brain um, charity in Liverpool. And that has been amazing to um, learn how, again, using those teaching styles, variations and teaching students with disabilities how to make simple millinery items, which we did. We did really successfully, apart from the fact when <laughs> because um, people with brain damage of some kind some of them had such bad disabilities that even um because when I was teaching them it was COVID and online um trying to teach them the skills it was quite difficult because a they'd have to have somebody with them that would have to explain things and b it was a whole new area for them to connect with but they if they got frustrated with something they would suddenly burst into song now that's because they also have singing lessons at the brain charity uh, which is amazing I mean some of the things they do there are just brilliant but they would burst into songs so we'd get 10 choruses of a Beatles song I get by a little help from my friends you know and things like that yeah, and it was really uplifting. And I only had these students for two hours, but those two hours, there was never a dull moment in those two hours. And it was just great. I always look for something that's going to challenge me. This is another thing, you know, working for the Hat Magazine. Ellie says to me, what are you up to today? I say, well, I'm doing this. And she'll go, oh, my goodness. And then we'll just chat about it. And then she'll say, let me know what's happened. And then I'll tell her what's happened. And then she'll say, oh, all right, I'll just write a little bit about it in the magazine. And then, you know, sometimes it goes in, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on how much space they've got. But yeah, I mean, but definitely the Brain Charity, it was so grounding and I'm so grateful for that. And it was there at a time when I needed it. You don't know when you need these things until later on. I want to ask you all about on your, particularly your teaching training, is you've written a book. Oh, yeah. How did you decide to write a book? What inspired you? That's There's so much love and attention that goes into something like that and sharing your skills in a different format. Yeah. Um, well, it was a very emotional time for me when I was writing that book. I, When I used to work for um, Liberties, there were several opportunities. This was in the 1990s um, for me because they had publishers there who would say to me, oh, we want you to write a book. And I used to write for their magazine anyway, at the same time as writing for Essentials and all the other Vogue and everything that I was writing for. Um, And then... Just drops in that she wrote for Vogue and for the Luna magazine, but that's Yeah, Vogue Sewing, though. Vogue Sewing, though. Um, but Yes, Vogue Sewing. Yeah, but I mean, and Threads, the American version, Threads, I wrote an article for them. Um, I wrote lots for um, a magazine called So Today. And then there's another one called Crafts Beautiful. Loads for those. In fact, when Ellie came over to have a look at what I'd written, there were four boxes on the table. And I said, that's what I've written, which was composed of over 50 articles, 60 articles, just that I'd written for other magazines. And and she went, well, we'll have no problem with getting articles then because you've got them all. But getting back to the book, um, you know, the opportunity kept coming and, you know, being offered to me and I kept turning it down because other things were happening. And then 
um my mum uh was ill with alzheimer's and i thought i've got to do it now i've got to do it now uh, it was at a time when i wasn't teaching i didn't have anything going on because there was too much with mum and um and I had a three hour journey to get to her and three hours back. So I couldn't do it in a day. So I was having to stay at my sister's and um, it was quite emotional. Um, the whole thing, although she was, I have to say, being looked after really well. Um, it was it was one of those kind of things that, you know, you just get through it and that's it. You just go get through it and get through it how you can. And I found that writing the book was helping me. So um, I would come home and then get two projects down. And then I would make the two projects. And I had these files where I just stick everything in files, which is the way I do it now as well. I have black files that I just stick everything in with the writing and everything and leave it and don't go back to it. And then I go to it after about a week or so and say oh my god that's terrible <laughs> and look at the writing and then go back with to it and, I was supposed yeah. To be yeah because when you first when things come out it's like verbal diarrhea I hate saying this I said it to Ellie yesterday but it is it's like verbal it was just quick get it on paper and then you have to decipher it and then work out what you want to have in it so and as I said at the time my mum was really ill so that was helping me and then because I do a lot of that I was taught very early by somebody make a file of bottom drawer articles so you put them in your bottom drawer and forget about them and then somebody will come to you and say can you do this and this is how I got to work with Ellie because she said to me can you do this and I said oh yeah I'm sure I've got something in my bottom drawer and she looked at me as if I was weird but I did have something at the time that was really fashionable and hey presto that was one of the biggest selling magazines that she's ever had uh, in fact, it sold out and she hasn't reprinted it because it was one of the biggest selling, as is this current issues, apparently selling like hotcakes. Anyway, um, and that's the August edition. Those of you, it's number 97, I think, or 98. Yeah, number 98, just to get that one in. Um, so I had a lot of bottom drawer stuff. I first, can, before my mum went into her final year I had a book that I originally wrote and and you know took it round a lot of publishers but I wasn't getting a good enough deal and so I um said right I'll just publish it myself so I did I published it myself which I didn't okay. realize yeah I know it's so so hard so I did all the buying of the ISBN numbers all this on my own but I was guided by the company who did all the printing and everything so they were like an agency company and they were really good and they um and they did it and in fact it sold a lot I mean the agency have sold so many books on Amazon it's just amazing and Ellie sold loads I've sold loads so it ended up being really good. But my mum got to put her hands on the file of the finished book two months before she died. I don't know whether she knew it was there, but, you know, and she held my hand That's afterwards. So, I, yeah, it was really, it meant so much. And it was written with such emotion so if you don't understand it, that's why. Um, but no, I know the people. So what can people enjoy in it? Because we haven't actually shared, shared that with them. No, what did you decide no. to put in the book? Well, nobody had written a proper tiara book, like how to make a wide, wired um, beaded headdress book. And in it, I decided to put... That was my Essex girl bit coming out. Did you say in it? <laughs> um, sorry. In it. <laughs> yeah. So in the book, I put everything that I wasn't taught, that I wanted to be taught at that 
time when I was trying to learn. So it was explained all the materials. So like what the different wires did, how the different wires, the knitted wire, which also is a godsend for lots of things, how they manipulate and move. And that's been the comments, actually, you know, the the three different um, projects in each section are, you know, great and people can make them if they want to. But what a lot of people have commented on Amazon is that it's the skills. And again, we get back to the skills thing. It's the things that people don't tell you that were the most interesting things in the book, which is great. I mean, you know, it was fine writing it and putting the projects in but by the time we got to print some of those projects were really out of date because you can't keep up by the time you know because fashions move on so quickly and this is why I really believe that you know selling a book as skills is the best thing to do anyway mum got to put her hands on it the nurses in the home you know the nursing home where she was thought I was absolutely mad but um anyway and then you know they got to see the book afterwards which was really nice so but yeah mum knew it was happening and that's all it it, that's what meant main thing to me you know selling the book and everything else is just the cherry on the cake well, we'll fill add a link to where someone can go and find your book because that would be sounds like a very important set of skills for you picking up. Whether you're making tiaras or transferring to other things, it's it's a good it's a goodie. I have a copy myself, signed by the author, in fact. Oh yes, I forgot I did that. <laughs> yeah, and you can get it from um, uh, you can get it from Amazon. You can get it from um, Ellie's. Um, you know the hat magazine because they have copies too um and watch this space that's all i'm saying because oh, watch this are, space. yeah watch this space because there are i can't tell you because i'd have to shoot you lauren and i'm not going to do that much oh, no, i'd much rather like to i'd like to be living to see it happen thank you yeah <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned there about writing the writing for the hat magazine and we both have the honor of getting to do that and working Yay. with a fantastic Ellie Stemony, how did this opportunity come about for you? I mean, Ellie is just wonderful. And um, what Ellie does is she surrounds herself with people who she knows and trusts to work with her. And then, but once you're in that process, she'll come up with these ideas, she'll uh, flash them in front of you, and then you'll go, Ooh. And then you'll go away and come back. I've done that so many times with different things, you know, with this current edition of the Hat Magazine and the video we did with the 3D. I mean, that magazine article has been, and people don't believe me when I tell them this, but that has been in the making for two years. I mean, we've discussed it for so long, how it's going to be, how it's going to go, And, you know, the way it's going to turn out and what we're going to include in it and what we're not going to include in it. And that has been a discussion that's been going on for two years. And uh, it's it's been really good because it's allowed. I don't know if she said that, but it allows more to be included in the article rather than can you write this article and do it now? It's really good because you get to discuss it, you be, get to twist ideas, throw out ideas. And that's a really, I mean, that's the way I work anyway. With the articles that I do, I hope that even though I teach people what they want to know, I do it in a different way. I hope I teach it in a different way. And I teach it in a way that even, this was another thing that when when Ellie asked me to join the magazine, the one thing I said to her was, I don't want to write for the professional milliners only. I want to write for the beginners. Because if you plant the seeds now with the beginners, look at what we can have later on and that has been my view from day one 
And thankfully, Ellie agreed with that, you know, and, you know, I just love Ellie and Peter to bits. You know, I'm really thankful that Ellie believed in me. You know, she believed that I had something to offer and she trusted that what I could do would be good. And, you know, how many people can say, I mean, my daughter's in this current magazine, she's on the 3D video because that's what she does. She does 3D model design and works for games companies. You know, how many other people can say that they've worked with their daughter? I just feel so blessed at the moment that I am in this position. And maybe I wouldn't have been in this position if that opportunity hadn't come along. And so was the British School of Millinery. When was that founded? Well, it was founded in 1996, and I did work at it then. I had to um, apply to the British um, government for the word British. I couldn't just have it on anything. And I think you still have to if you don't own the government's approval to have that word you can't use it like you the you know british gas and things like that you can't do it and at the time i applied nobody had bothered to apply so i did my accountant at the time said let's have a go let's see if we can do it <laughs> and thankfully to my accountant at the time we did it and um uh, you had to get back in from several organizations who were current i had to be in print which i was i had to have worked for uh, major british companies which i did i worked for liberties i worked for there was another company that i'd worked for uh, that i had to include and um and i got it and i do a bit at the moment I'm working on something which again I can't tell you I'd have to shoot you if I told you what I'm doing yeah I know there's something going on wait to see yeah we'll wait to see but it, it shouldn't be too long and there's also something that's happening in March that is really exclusive to us only at the British School of Millinery and that is really really good and again, I can't tell you because I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you another question then so you stop teasing us with all the good stuff. Oh, right. Okay. How has your approach to making and millinery changed over your career? Oh, wow. That is such a hard question. You have to evolve. You have to keep moving. You have to keep you know adapting like a chameleon you have to keep you know we're in this style so we'll go this way and then oops we'll go over this way I hate people who are stale milliners I just hate it so so much if that's all you've got to offer then you're not stepping outside your comfort zone I risk you know like I did with the brain charity and let's face it you know, there are other jobs where I've done this, where I've taken a leap of faith and I've said, well, do you know what? Has anybody else done this? No. Shall I try? Well, what am I going to lose? I either, I either win and it's all fine or I fail. And if I fail, I'll learn from it. You know, I think a lot of milliners don't realise that when you fail, it's good because you can see what worked, what didn't work and how you can improve it. And um, I think a lot of milliners are frightened of that. A lot of teachers are frightened of that. And I, you know, to be quite honest, I've got nothing to lose yeah, but everything to gain if I just step outside my comfort zone. If you don't work outside the box, you don't get the opportunities. Like at the moment, I've been asked to teach at um, Paul McCartney's um, University in Liverpool, which is Lipper, which is amazing. And he was there at the day when I was going in. And where? where is Paul McCartney? I want to see him. So we hid in a room and then we heard his voice. And it was walking past and it was just like, 
see how many other people would have that chance? How many other people would have the chance of working with their daughter? You know, I know I'm outspoken. I know I do things that people do not like. Well, tough, it's me. And this is me. I'm Denise Innes and Spencer. And that is who I'm going to be. And I hope that I'm a milliner, a writer, a teacher, an enabler, and an encourager. That's what I want to be. And, you know, whether it be in any of the skills that I'm doing, in any of the projects that I'm working with, I just want to do it to the best of my ability. If I fail, I fail, but I'll learn from it. And you've teased us with so many amazing projects, but my final question is what is a project that you're allowed to share with us that you're excited to be working on at the moment goodness me for the next article so that'll be 99 um I'm I should have put it in 98 but it there wasn't enough room so it got chucked out like sometimes things get chucked out and said well can we put that in the next issue so which is a relief when you're running out of time for writing but then when you come back to it and you look at the words and and again you think oh my god why did I write that and then you re re re-establish it I'm um doing a showgirl headdress I'm showing you but nobody else can see but it it's um, just how to make a very lightweight frame on the head. And um, to me, dancers, I mean, I know what a dancer has to do. I used to do it for companies that I used to work for. So to have a heavy headdress, and at the time when I was dancing, I wore some of the old um, black and white minstrel shows, which are banned now in England, Um, but the old black and white minstrel show costumes and the designer worked with us when we were wearing them. And they were so, especially the showgirl headdresses, were so heavy. They'd weigh about five pounds each headdress because they had so many layers of buckram to keep them sturdy. But now with this, I mean, you know, the crinoline wire um, tube that I use. Um, Now we've got that and we can make different shapes with the tubing. You know, it's amazing because you know, they don't have to weigh as much. In fact, I think I've taken off two thirds of the weight of a headdress by doing this. And the only thing, I mean, you can read from the magazine, but the only thing that will weigh anything on the headdress will be the decoration that you put on it. And that's the way it should be. So many actors and actresses, especially when they're working on period stuff, they don't want to be wearing heavy headdresses. And this is what this article and these series of articles have been about and how you can dis- disperse the weight, how you can keep the headdress on the head. Issue 99 will be out very soon. Yes, because we are hot footing making it at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah, but by the time this article goes out, it will be issue 100 we'll be working on. Yeah, I issue should Issue 100 is going to be very exciting as well. Oh, yes. I can't wait because there's so many good things going to happen in that. Yeah, definitely. Yes. It has been such an honour to have you on this podcast and to get to dog cats with you, Denise. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And please keep listening to this podcast keep buying the hat magazine because there are so many things that you can learn thank you for joining me for this episode of milliner info i hope you enjoyed our conversation with denise thank you to our podcast sponsors for their support hatbox australia hat academy millinery australia hattis millinery supplies house of adorn judith and millinery supply house hats by lego be unique millinery Lifted Millinery, Louise McDonald Milliner, and The Hat Magazine. You can find a link to each of these businesses through the podcast app you're listing on or on our website. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Millinery Info podcast series, I'd love to hear from you. You can either head over to our Patreon page and sign up, or if you have any questions about it, please drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. I'm your host, Lauren Ritchie, and I've enjoyed bringing you this episode of Millinery Info today. I look forward to talking hats with you again soon.